Hello, Andrew here. Welcome to lecture five of the Digital Games and Contemporary Youth Culture module. This lecture will be around the impact of games on youth culture. This is a chart. Well, I've shown a number of groups of young people just to kind of challenge perceptions of, you know, the, the, the means they may have or, you know, concepts of wealth even. A number of people in groups would have smartphones. You'd ask them to kind of pr produce that and just to show you show them this chart of apps that would be readily available for free in the average smartphone to date. And it's, um, you know, the the value it would have had when it first reached the market in around late 80s or late 70s, early 80s. It's quite startling even for, I suppose, older generations to look at just to see how, you know, something as futuristic as video conferencing, which looked like totally implausible um, and had a price of a quarter of a million dollars of, you know, something that's given away for free within a phone now um, is quite a significant change there. And just to, sh to show how dematerialized these technologies have come very, very quickly. And likewise, with the younger generation, um, taking these things for granted, I suppose, or just accepting this as a norm where it wasn't always that case. So um, that side of it being, you know, the, the, the rise of an information society, a dematerialized one, being a, a vital part of this. When we look at digital games rooted in, you know, a rise in affluence and free time in late industrial society. So we see this kind of handover from a late industrial society to an early information age, right the way through to where we are now in this sort of age of an internet of everything and you know uh, you, the ubiquity being the the vital the vital component um of these technologies and you know how they how we interact with them so kind of a key point that's thrown up around this as well as you know what the the, the, the idea of what is considered social or anti-social behavior in particular with youth culture young people and um you know how they interact with society in in general and this is something which um, we, you know, we see in, in behavior, we look later on that, you know, there's potential pitfalls or negativities to the behavior of, you know, in being involved in, in, in gaming culture or, you know, the, the use of technology or the role of technology in the lives of young people. But also just in the broader sense that um, there's been significant changes to how young people play and the, um, the how they interact with their, their physical environments and this kind of dictating a lot of those um, scenarios that we see of like online, you know, multiplayer gaming and, you know, the holiday of making friends and who, who could be a friend and the virtual aspect of that, which is kind of, you know, something older generations would be somewhat fearful of, rightfully so. But also, you know, that just being um, a, a, a natural causal thing by now, I suppose, where young people, you know, do interact this way and that being um, going forward a norm rather than something unique. This quote from Henry Jenkins is it was a bridge quote is quite um, pointed around that, just describing the change in the behavior. And, uh, you know, this idea of protective custody, I suppose, where be it for, you know, uh, any number of reasons of just the, the, the role of, you know, access to public space, be it through insurance or, you know, a kind of a more corporate side to how people um, interact with, 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 with physical free space, um, changing drastically compared to previous generations. And a lot of those same experiences, and I suppose the vital thing being the intensity of that experience, the thing being almost real, uh, uh, being conducted or uh, uh, almost able to be conducted in inside these games. Um, what we'll see is there's still this overriding sort of notion that, um, you know, game violence and... Um, different sort of you know scatological humor i suppose and these things which jenkins would refer to as 19th century boy culture uh still prevalent within game game cultures uh we'll speak about that in later uh, lectures around the the um instances such as gamergate and this sort of gender bias within games and how that's kind of transpired but overall i suppose in a the popular media sense that role of games need, being violent are coming from, you know, the, the origins of 
war games, space games, invader, shoot 'em up sort of those sort of teenage adolescent boy violence elements being a key concept uh, in in game culture that would keep it uh, considered you know a low culture um, form of entertainment I suppose much akin to how um, comic books would have been perceived or probably would continue to be perceived in some quarters where it's just feeding and pandering to like those indulgences of you know young adolescent boys and their what they would like. This obviously has been challenged in in particular with gaming and game culture as the technology has driven the ubiquity of it, and all this kind of arriving at um it being a, a constant updating and reappraisal of the importance and significance of games and game culture um which is fed into academic spheres also the nature of games or the game developers themselves and what they hope to attain with their games or you know the the the, the, the level and the aesthetic overall aesthetic of the games being driven to a higher level and the significance of a likewise with the last lecture where we spoke about serious games and we see like this this desire for the for games to really impact on the real world, so all those things kind of constantly leading to a a reappraisal of what would be considered low culture initially, and where that's kind of uh, the the changes that are coming from that. How all this really fits with a um, youth culture is uh, in its very origins, I suppose, of technologies um, where the the first the earliest and the first adopters of new technologies would normally be younger people who are looking for the new the next new thing and i suppose the vital thing of this is what what would initially be if what would initially appear like a fad uh, some of them do disappear as fads and other things do reta are retained as like persistent cultural changes so it, it, young people delivering all this to a broader sort of culture is the the vital part of it now i suppose where we have some examples later on when we look at say something like pokemon go and you know uh, augmented reality technologies really kind of buffeting up against that how real space is interacted with more than just a game environment so um we'll we'll discuss that in a little while but the other thing, I suppose, of the game culture repurposing those technologies, which I suppose is something that would feed into the the irreverence that would appeal to a youth culture and the immediacy of experience. So if we look at how, you know, the game technologies have arrived, where we speak about the, the oscilloscope being repurposed for a game environment, the, the television then being repurposed for like a home entertainment console sort of gaming environment the pc likewise being um repurposed for gaming and then that's with the likes of ne online networks shareware and sharing economies all kind of intertwining with each other to lead to like multi multiplayer online games and you know that, that everything to kind of arrive from there 3d technologies which would have been super expensive when they came out of first mostly used in um you know high-end computer animated films or um cad a more architectural sort of end of things and how this just with the processing power of computers and just you know stronger better graphics cards where all this became um available to game makers and to game players as such and leading to that sort of immersive immediacy which was the the vital sort of crossover Likewise, with just open sourcing of software and game engines and like the free sharing economy now being something that um, has quite a significance in, in a game culture or in that sort of youth culture that it, it marks it out, I suppose, from how more mainstream commodified industry sort of speak would apply to those sorts of um, uh, to those types of technologies. Uh, I suppose the key thing there is just that to note that those technological advance, advance, advances are the intrinsic part of uh, computer game advancement. So it's to arrive, to, to further evolve that um, immediacy of experience next to renegotiating what is considered real 
and the physical space next to the virtual space and these things all become and kind of you know and that sort of point of convergence again where everything's kind of arriving somewhat on a head or the technologies are are making that possible um again we look at something like modding cultures and you know this we'll speak about playbore later on and this sort of crossover of ownership being a vital thing and how that fits within um traditional industrial models again being something which is um it lies in the very near future of game game cultures and game industry i suppose and how that's all going to fit together so the arcade being the first vital sort of you know like a sort of locus so a place where young people could hang out and kind of group and gather and be separate you know and form their own sort of culture and identity um being something that would have spawned out, spawned out initially from the laboratory setting of it and that obviously underpinning the kind of youth culture element of computer games and you know people having young people having a place to go and meet and you know have that sort of affinity with, with what they're what they're doing and how they're how they're how they want to interact with it much akin to how they would have been about you know young people in along tribal lines with music anything like this you know where they just there's a certain sort of tribal element to it so the arcade would have been the first sort of obvious um location of that quickly when it changes into a living room environment we see that there's a bit of a crossover there where um you know the, the family console i suppose or the family experience kind of something which would dilute the um the significance of a youth culture in that end uh and that that being kind of closely related to the types of games that young people were playing where it would have gone from you know space invaders missile command war based shoot 'em up games to something more um family orientated and that that sort of gives us a bit of a picture of where the youth culture would have morphed and kind of spread to we're going to run a video now and then i'll come back and we can kind of get under the bonnet of this a little bit more and discuss the the split in games. Born out of Cold War anxiety and nurtured in the era of counterculture, video games would soon become their own weapon in a worldwide culture shift, starting with one great character. The earliest video games were beginning to boom as Japan's own gaming industry emerged in the aftermath of World War II. Advancements in technology drove the country to rebuild. Technology rapidly emerged as key to Japan's success. There's enormous push for education through government for technology. Japanese youth are highly technologically literate during that period of time. Japan found its niche in electronics, figuring out what the, what the rest of the world was doing in electronics and making it better and mass producing and making it cheaper. If you look at Japanese culture after World War II, you definitely see the reflected experience of the atomic bomb in a lot of the work. Godzilla, king of the monsters, stalking the earth, crushing all the earth. It's a period of time where Godzilla and the great rubber monster movies are coming out. So if you combine the cultural content of, the, of Godzilla with the technological power of the computer, you have something that looks like the fascination that's created by games. Japan was already at the height of the electronics industry. But in 1978, Tomohiro Nishikado put his country at the forefront of the video game industry as well, with an endless wave of space invaders. <laughs> I initially thought of humans as the invaders, but the idea of humans shooting humans was criticized as inhumane. So I thought about what would be suitable and figured aliens invading instead. I figured there would not be any problems shooting monsters. 
I think when you look at Space Invaders, it's not a stretch to sort of, you know, look at the aliens in the sky and think about, you know, planes flying over Japan, you know, clearly uh, weapons of mass destruction being dropped from the sky. The thing that's interesting about Space Invaders is it was a very early uh, fantasy scenario. When you're playing it, you're going, we are actually being invaded, right? You know, I personally am being invaded by these guys. I am the frontline security for mankind. Space Invaders had clearly unlocked something powerful in the Japanese psyche, and millions of teens were hooked. And it just took off in that way that really only in Japan do things take off in that way. You know, with video games, it was something new, it was something different. There was something to leave your house and experience. In Japan, that's particularly important because the homes are so much smaller. So uh, teens go out there in a way that is a bit different from the United States. <laughs> We got a hint from the human heartbeat to create one of the sound effects in the game. The low tone of the ground rumbling when it was approaching. I guess we can create better sounds nowadays, but those days when we only had limited techniques and devices, that was the best we could do. But we think we came close enough. You think about what Space Invaders did from a music and audio standpoint, and it's really, it was four notes. It was, you know, dun, 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 dun. But what they did is they took the tempo, and as the invaders got closer and closer, they started to speed that up. As this music got quicker and quicker and quicker, and it, and it started to make you panic a little as you're playing the game. To cash in on the craze, shop owners cleared out their merchandise and set up Space Invader arcades overnight. But not everyone welcomed the fad. Lots of moms refused to let their kids play games. It became a social issue since there were kids who had stolen money or made phony coins to play games at arcades. It was said to be a serious problem concerning child education. I think with Space Invaders, what, what happened was that technology for the first time created this big rift between the generations. And, you know, the, the older set who thought they were up with everything and they understood what was happening in the automobile industry and with television suddenly was left behind because they couldn't figure out why this silly game was so popular. All across the country, kids are being swept away by video games. They watch the dance. In America, you start to see all kind of ordinances passed where, you know, a certain number of teenagers couldn't be in a convenience store or an arcade at the same time. It really established an entire culture. Also, the thing about those games that was a little bit um, sad in a way was that they inevitably ended in the player's defeat. Uh, we didn't think about it, I think, consciously at the time, but I, I, I wonder if that doesn't reflect some of that Cold War paranoia that at the end of the day, war is... Uh, a defeatist game you're going to always lose. But soon, a less pessimistic game would sweep Japan and the world by storm. Enter Pac-Man. We see there's that sort of, just to underpin, kind of taken from the origins and, uh, you know, through an arcade scenario and the, the war game being a vital thing or that uh, invading, outside invasion thing as we see quite close to the to kind of mutated monster Godzilla aspect of you know post-atomic Japanese society and then also mimicking the the the, the Cold War environment which would prevail in um in the states at the same time um where that quickly went in Japan would be towards you know um more character based games and as we see here from Tori Iwatani um, the idea of right at the center of, of Pac-Man to appeal to a female game enthusiast. So there, quick, this being one of the first instances of trying to go in a different direction, really, and have a broader appeal. And, you know, the success of Pac-Man speaks to that in a, to a great extent. Also, how uh, easy to package it is and to sell on, and that being a vital thing driving the, the, the games industry. Um, so 
we quickly then you know we, there's a bit of a split where we look at japan there'd be companies like it's harry in, in the states who um would follow that to some degree but i suppose be slightly more related to the the film industry or any sort of movements that would come on and from you know adopting characters or stories from from the the, the cinema cinema grammar that they have and they, you know the, which would be the bigger culture at the time in japan it became somewhat a bit more unique where it related more to the visual culture and um, that was immersed in anime and manga and then just to to take that further to have a stronger sort of gameplay with memorable characters and to make like you know an exploratory environment which is more inviting and having those kind of more complex complex storylines and character motivations would all feed that sort of um market and at the same time begin to give young people in japan that sort of identity that they could identify themselves with this gaming subculture or youth culture or even particular games that they'd, they'd, um, they were playing at the time. Then moving on to like the late 80s into the early 80s, early 90s, we'd have um, a bigger upsurge in interactive story worlds and th just to take on those sorts of um, uh, threads of it to become more complex. And that being related to the emerging technology and the ubiquity of it. At the same time, it, it, there was an expectation put on this technology by, um, you know, a, an emerging cyberpunk movement. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, the, the science fiction writers at the time, and one in particular being William Gibson, and what they, the expectations put on a virtual reality or this other reality in a cyberspace. So there was almost like a, a, an imaginative framework for the technology developers and the game developers to kind of keep uh trying to attain a heightened experience and this has kind of really fed into a lot of the interactive story worlds that we'd have mixing with the virtual and augmented realities that we see almost to today and onwards into the future what has kind of what held all the way through and has still kind of held is this sort of the i suppose a moral panic around certain games and that immediacy of it especially in relation to violent games and overall, there being the broader public perception in the negative that are the persistence of war games, shooter games, roguelike games, beat em ups, this sort of, you know, appealing to teenage boys, irreverence, violence, horror, and scare, and just, you know, um, that fitting with the, the a kind of general consensus of older generations being somewhat fearful and dubious around what youth culture is and what it actually offers. That said, there you know the potential sort of effects on youth behavior with just the you know I'm gonna just to note a lot of these things of um the, the change in behavior of physically even just sitting in the one place for long periods of time. And um, being plugged into online game worlds, and uh, you know what that potential effects that that might have. I've noted that this, there's no really conclusive findings on this. It's all still quite speculative at the moment, um, but it may, may well be true in a lot of cases. So you just relating to you know obesity being one that the the downturn in physical activity being a, a vital sort of. Um, breaking off in in terms of how youth culture and gaming culture would would be different to um, you know more sports led environments or stuff done you know out in the streets I suppose just you know being outdoors rather than sitting in a chair. Likewise, with the just attention deficit or stimulus disorders, with the immediacy of games and how um, you know how instantly. It, responsive the game is and you know again potential sort of knock-ons of that to like just stimulus disorders or repetitive stress or even epilepsy with like viewing flashing lights or whatever again all things that you know are there and have always been there to some shape or form but whether game cultures are kind of driving those sort of negative effects on the behavior is uh, you know something to to be considered
another sort of just to talk about some of the phenomena that have come out or the reworkings of um you know youth culture in in the face of like emerging games and the how prevalent they've been is a different take on celebrity and you know the youtube generation i suppose or people who you know critiquing games and doing playthroughs having a persona that goes with that um all different types of reviews and commentaries of games and this leading to you know is something that's it's given birth to a whole new level of celebrity or associative celebrities i suppose where you know everyone might have their favorite youtuber who reviews a certain type of game or has a certain sort of irreverent humor that goes with that and you know it it's still being considered games and games reviews where other reviewers would look at certain sort of areas and different sensibilities of games all this i suppose overall is leading towards a more interrogation of games gameplay and the entertaining value of it in the obvious in a popular sense of it and also just the very nature of it being you know more rigorous look at games which can only add to games becoming better i suppose a vital part of all this i suppose is the where it fits with you know like a lot of youtube celebrities even would have their own personas online and uh, you know that that being a version of you know i, I suppose where uh, the phenomena of, of avatars really come in and um you know just with first player immersion games and um the, the whole uh, the idea of an avatar embodiment and where this yeah, might be I'm leading like so you know additional sort of uh, or complementary aspects to 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 game game um culture would be the increase in you know kind of where it's relinking with the real with the physical world i suppose where um you know the, the cosplay element or the dress dressage sense of it that goes with the with the games um being quite a huge part of that and you know people really embodying a certain sort of avatar that they would that they would take to so that being a significant sort of branch of uh, game culture, I suppose, much akin to, I don't know, you know, present through their music or different tribes of music, I suppose, even with like, you know, be it goth, punk, whatever, and the certain sort of tribal um, codes that go with that in terms of, you know, the, the uh, dress, behavior, costume, you know, there's a, a kind of a similarity going on there. But I suppose this is, a hugely a huge emerging area and a, something of real significance when it comes to game culture and again leads to different types of expressions and um, self-expressions and it, we'll speak later on about say likes of different games and about where gender and sexuality even relates to these sorts of like, real real expressions um in youth culture to come out of game environments another additional to that would be sort of a more tech based side of it where you know land parties have always been there from you know the first sort of when dial-up connections were used playing games where you know people you know, people arrive with their own equipment to the one place link up to the one network and play so that being you know there's, there's that sort of hidden tech element of of how how games are played or made or the convergence of those two things um being something that kind of comes through there so it's um another just to have to note that as well that there's you know it, it, you you you're allowing for expressive sort of behavior and you know people that would want to dress up and be that imaginative and creative that way and also the kind of more technical introverted side where there's room to meet and gather in physical space as well as virtual space with that i'm just going to jump back and forth for a few minutes just to look at different sides of that are the potential pitfalls or different developments that can happen in terms of a young person's lived experience through games most vitally i suppose as we we would have looked at earlier through esports and this sort of emerging um celebrity that's coming across there as much as youtube celebrities but through the actual players of games and also the impact that all this can have on mental health i suppose so i'm just going to jump back and forth with a few different thoughts on that um and then we'll um yeah i'll, I'll just pick up on that afterwards 
For Seoul's young gamers, it all starts out in a PC bong. But if things go well, they'll end up in a professional gaming house. Often recruited at the age of 17, the gaming house will become their new home until they change teams or retire, and players will live, eat, sleep, and train together under one roof. For most gamers, this is their first time living away from their parents, so the coach's job isn't just to train them, but to act as a guardian and father figure. The responsibility of caring for 20 young adults while also trying to turn a profit can be a lot to handle. My players don't have such a good deal to me. I'm trying to invest in money 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 to me. But I'm trying to invest in money to me. I'm trying to invest in StarCraft 1. 주 종목으로 하던 시절이었고 그 종목에 몇몇 선수들이나 이런 뭐좀 좋지 않은 선수, 사람들이 연루돼서 그때 스캔들이 한번 있었고 그때 굉장한 위기를 맞이했었고 한국 e스포츠 자체가 Not everyone cares so strongly about their players' well-being. For some coaches, financial gain is more important. e-sports history has been through multiple match-fixing scandals. One episode in particular was the biggest scandal in esports history, and it nearly resulted in one of its most gifted stars paying the ultimate price. His name is Chun Ming Ki, but he's better known by his gamer name, Promise. In Korea, I'm called Pimi. 외국 사람들이 Pimi로 발음을 잘 못하더라고요. 그래서 그냥 Promise로 바꿨어요. 약속을 많이 했어요. 약속을 많이 하고 다녔어요. 뭐 잘하겠다 하고 약속 지키겠다는 의미로 그냥 프로미스로 바뀌었어요. So when did you first get into gaming? 세 살. 그냥 마냥 중학교 때 게임이 좋았는데 이제 그냥 마냥 그냥 준비를 되게 열심히 했어요. 그 프로 생활 준비를 그냥 가난하니까 뭐 하루에 식사 뭐 컵라면 한 개, 캔커피 두 개였고 그냥. 그냥 가끔씩 팬들이 뭐배 안고프냐고 뭐, 뭐 음식 배달 시켜주고 그렇게 해서 뭐 그냥 연습했는데. Promise's coach started the team on borrowed money, and had gotten himself into some serious debt. At the time, the players knew nothing about this. The coach tried to earn back the money through match fixing, and forced his team to throw their games. What was your relationship like with the team's manager? 말 되게 잘하는 어, 사기꾼이었죠. <웃음> 승부 조작을 하라고 하는데 그거를 이제 엄청 잘 속였어요. 그러니까 하기 싫고 그냥 나가서 그냥 내 하고 싶은 플레이 하고 싶고 그런데 뭐안 하면은 뭐 선수 생활 적게 하겠다 뭐 이런 얘기가 나오니까 그냥 뭐 그때는 뭐 제가 생각도 없었고 그러니까. 죽기 살기로 게임만 했죠 진짜 그냥 나오게 되니까 그냥 그때부터는 이제 마음이 너무 힘든 거예요 그냥 제가 그것 때문에 다시 이제 인생의 재기를 못할 정도로 그냥 계속 부정적인 생각만 드니까 그러다 결국에는 제가 좀뭐안 좋은 쪽으로 뭐 자살하는 쪽으로 해서 이제 The shame of intentionally losing was too much for promise. And after posting a suicide note online, he jumped off of a 12-story building. He was 21 at the time. Miraculously, he survived when his body smashed through the roof of a recycling center, breaking his fall and putting him into a coma. After an excruciating 11-hour surgery, where doctors had to reattach his jaw, Promise began to recover. The professional gaming community quickly mobilized to raise funds for Promise's medical bills. Promise 
After the ordeal, players around the world started a secret support network of esports athletes to ensure that they would never again fall victim to exploitation and corruption in professional gaming. 팬분들이랑 그냥 뭐 모금해 주신 분들 그렇고 말이라도 따뜻하게 해 주신 분들도 고맙고 뭐 그리고 협회에서도 그렇고 뭐 캐스파 협회에서도 그렇고 라이엇에서도 이제 뭐 지원해 주셔서 그냥 건강하게 어느 정도 건강하게 돌아왔으니까 그래서 지금 주목도 줄수 있고 게임도 할수 있고 그래요. These are the formative years of your life, really. And at that age, parents, teachers, or in, in this case, the managers of, of gaming teams have a responsibility and a duty of care. He was a young guy, and that person decided to exploit him for money. And with the added weight of performing on your shoulders, it must just be damaging to everything you understand about the world. And it let him to do the worst thing a person can do to themselves. So that's quite an extreme example of, you know, um, someone reaching the height of an emerging um, new industry and a sort of, you know, popular phenomenon, which, um, you know, and in, in, in Seoul and Korea in particular seems to be, you know, one of the first sort of, it, it, one of the most extreme versions of that again. Within the same documentary, we'd have um, journalists going to visit the PC banks where uh, young people play or pe gamers in general play and describing the situations where, you know, some people would sit, would wear diapers sitting in front of the of the, the computer screen so as not to lose game time. And that being sort of something quite significant, I suppose, just in terms of how marked a knock on on, on human behavior these games and game industries and cultures around that uh, will form. I suppose there's definitely parallels to be drawn with, you know, the early days of music industries or sports industries um, where, you know, this sort of ha not a regulated sort of industry as such or where, uh, you know, all this sort of, there's any room for corruption or, you know, uh, all sorts of inappropriate or illegal activity going on below the surface and how this might affect or impact on young people in this instance who are, you know, the gamers who are kind of coming along and learning to compete like that. What's also interesting, I suppose, is this sort of natural emergent support system that came out of the gaming communities to go uh, uh, to uh, associate with that as well. In Promises um, case, I suppose it's worth remarking how, you know, the part that say poverty would play in the whole lot of this and, you know, it did that be, you know, not being unable to eat or relying on, you know, uh, your fans to kind of support you as you become something showing how imbalanced this, this, this all is as an emerging industry. I just want to flag a few other sort of potential negatives that could come around this or perils of games before we look at a, the flip side of it, I suppose, and so a positive of it. With that, 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 the whole thing around um, game violence being something which never really appears to go too far away and relates to moral panics or, you know, any number of, you know, um, newspaper reports, or especially in relation to you know, teen introverted teenage boys who play violent games and then commit um, mass shootings in school, high school shootings like the likes of Columbine High School or Erfurt in Germany, and that being something which is quite hard to 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 separate in some in some senses of you know the, the how um, numb I suppose or desensitized young people may be from the real thing. If they're playing games again there's any amount of research that's gone on in, in in these areas that is still inconclusive um but it, i suppose it's something that it, which is always going to be part of it and you know the introverted nature of you know games or you know the anti-social i suppose nature of games can feed that in some senses next to more realistic simulations um given some version of the um of the uh you know some something that it almost appears real 
also just you know the addictive nature of games and the obsessive game the, the, the obsessive play nature of it you know that can feed into in-game purchases or you know getting people hooked on a game i suppose and then having a reveal so casual gaming was something we'll speak about again but this being an area of potentially with a perilous side of it like that of endorsing gambling or you know just some sort of um monetized version after the fact once people are in and playing a game and that sort of obsessive nature that all things potentially negative around games and um to be to be looked at you know we'll speak about casual gaming later on so i'll kind of look a little bit closer at that and just how kind of cynical the business models are around that really rather than the games themselves um on the flip side again Hello, um, I'm Johnny Chiadini. I am senior video producer for a website called Eurogamer.net, which is an independent gaming site. In other words, I make videos about video games. I first joined the games industry in 2008 when I looked, there it is, there's my name. I like to spell it out phonetically, it makes me feel like a species of dinosaur. <laughs> but I joined the games industry in 2008 when I looked like this. I um, thought that was a good way to dress myself. And I started an internship at Independent Television News. I worked there for three years before moving to a website called GameSpot for a further three years. And then I went freelance for a year, during which time I helped Channel 4 make a program called Two Players. And then in 2015, I joined the Eurogamer team. Now, that's my career history, but I also have another history, one millions of people worldwide share, but comparatively few people are comfortable discussing. And that's my history with mental health. I've suffered from depression and anxiety since I was about 14 years old, but I wasn't diagnosed until 2012. I took antidepressants for two years and also underwent a course of cognitive behavioural therapy, both of which I found to be extremely useful. I still have my rough patches, of course, but all in all I feel pretty well equipped to deal with my issues. I'm very comfortable, in fact, talking about my disorders and what it's like to live with them, and for that reason I feel incredibly lucky. So many people across the world, men especially, find it extremely difficult to talk about mental health, and there's still a tremendous amount of stigma attached to the topic. So why am I telling you all of this? Well, as you've probably guessed, video games and mental health are two topics very close to my heart. I make a show for Eurogamer called Low Batteries, which seeks to examine how the two interact. That's what led me to be invited to do this talk, and it's what leads me to this question. Can a video game save a life? Now, for me, the answer to that question is an immediate and unequivocal yes, but I realize a seven-word question with a one-word answer doesn't really make for the most interesting of discussions. So why don't we try this? How can a video game save a life? Well, firstly, video games make us feel good, and we're going to come back to that in a second. But first, I need you to understand video games are absolutely everywhere. The biggest video game in the world right now is a game called League of Legends. It's what we call a MOBA, or a multiplayer online battle arena game. In a game of League of Legends, two teams of players face off as op at opposite ends of a map, and they try to destroy one another, basically. And in 2014, 67 million people worldwide played this game every single month. During peak gameplay hours in 2014, 7.5 million people could be found playing this video game at the same time. To put that into perspective, the population of London, which is where I'm from, in 2014 was 8.5 million, just one million more. So try and imagine a city, if you can, in which every single day, at the same time, seven out of eight people stop whatever it is they're doing, go to a computer, log in, and start playing the same video game. League of Legends is absolutely vast, and it's also very tactically complicated. If, as a League of Legends player, you've got less than 500 hours on the clock, you're still considered a novice. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we have games like Candy Crush. Candy Crush is criminally simple, and yet it is also played by millions of people worldwide every single day. If you get on a bus or a train, you are practically guaranteed to run into somebody 
playing this game. You don't even need to look very hard to see it. You can just watch the movement of their thumb and the slightly glazed expression on their faces. <laughs> But anyway, this game is, is played by millions. And between these two games, between the very, very simple Candy Crush and the very, very complicated League of Legends, we have all sorts of games designed and aimed at different devices, different age groups, and different demographics. Video gaming really has permeated every level of society. Now, according to mental health charity Mind, one in four people in the UK alone will experience a difficulty with mental health every single year. I'm not trying to say that there's a causal link between these two things, but you don't need me to draw you a Venn diagram to understand the crossover between people who enjoy video games and people who suffer with mental health is pretty significant. As it is, I have drawn you a Venn diagram. <laughs> it's just not very scientific. So video games are absolutely everywhere, great, but they also make us feel good. Now, how does that work? Well, pretty much every video game in the world is designed along the same principles. You challenge your player, and then you reward your player for completing whatever challenge it is you've set them. Here's an example. This is Tetris, one of the best known video games in the entire world. As you probably know, blocks come down from the top of the screen and you arrange them to complete horizontal rows. When you finish a row, it disappears and you get some points. But if the blocks reach the top of the screen, it's game over. Pretty simple. And that's all very lovely and tactile and wonderful and engaging. But the thing is, if you really know your Tetris, you'll probably spend most of your time playing like this, stacking all of the blocks to one side of the screen and deliberately leaving a gap one square wide on the opposite end, all because you're waiting for that block up there, the straight four. Now, this little Tetramino, that's what they're called, Tetraminos, it slots in there and it takes out four rows at once in a beautiful move called, wait for it, a Tetris. And when you get a Tetris, you get a load of points, great, but you also get a little sound effect and you get a flashing animation. And that's this game's way of saying, well done, you've done something pretty good. Because playing like this is actually kind of a gamble. So when it pays off and you get your Tetris, you feel really good about yourself. You feel smart and dynamic, and you feel like you're in control of your own destiny. But more than that, you feel like you're good at being in control of your own destiny. Now, that little pip of satisfaction, that feeling that you've done something of which you can be proud, that's actually surprisingly rare for somebody suffering from a mental health disorder like, for instance, depression. So for somebody to be distracted from their problems, however briefly, and made to feel good about something they've done, it's actually pretty special. I've done some work with this, again, with my uh, show Low Batteries, talking about the concept of the sad game. Now, the idea behind the sad game is people suffering from depression will sometimes have a video game towards which they gravitate when things are particularly bad. The idea is it distracts their active mind just long enough to give them a bit of a breather between themselves and the immediacy of their problems. I, myself, have used these games extensively. I also happen to be very, very good at Tetris. <laughs> so video games are absolutely everywhere, and video games make us feel good. Tremendous. But video games have also come on in leaps and bounds since 1984, when Tetris was first introduced. Now we have games coming out every single year designed around cooperation, around communication, and around fostering communities. Now these game communities, each one designed around a different video game, they're designed to celebrate the game everyone's playing, sure, but they're also designed to get people sharing their own experiences and paying attention to the experiences of others. In other words, these communities being fostered around video games are designed to get people reaching out to others and helping them have a better time. And ultimately, that is exactly the kind of support network somebody suffering with a mental health disorder ought to have access to. Okay, the talk is really interesting one there. The links on the, the video um, we're checking out and also the associated videos, just a profile in different areas of mental health um, and games kind of associated with that. It's all very well worth a watch. Um, yeah, just you can see the, just the, the sheer ubiquity of games, the numbers of people playing next to, you know, real issues such as mental health showing a... Uh, 
kind of a vital crossover there of the potential of it or you know the potential of people with mental health issues to be, come in close encounter with games and just the nature of games of you know releasing endorphins rewarding people uh, all these aspects of it potentially having a real crossover there you know so it's, it's uh, well worth kind of considering that with games that way as well um jay mcgonagall is this the term super gaming um you know which basically trying to get this idea of, of using games to on a massive scale to um be, better culture and society really um and to have that transformative power being the vital thing be it around um environmental issues any sort of problems that need to be solved and for games and game players and game environments to deliver those sorts of problem solving um play to, to, to solve those problems kind of akin to what we would have looked at with the last lecture in the serious games and you know real scientific problems being thrown out there to game players and you know getting solutions coming back that couldn't be automated um or you know delivered by a computer environment so the potential and the prospect for games in the in a broader sense of like you know youth culture really having a significance and you know having having that sort of causal change aspect to it um being you know palpable i suppose something that can almost happen um to kind of illustrate that i suppose i picked a the the, the phenomenon of pokemon go and an augmented reality environment and how that buffets up against real 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 environments and real sort of environment significant environments be a consecrated ground or you know somewhere where it has a enormous historical significance for any number of people and i suppose this is one of the challenges which lies ahead in the real sense of um how space physical space uh can be negotiated and you know, physical problems can be negotiated through games. In this video, we will be counting down the top five worst places to play Pokemon Go. If you are easily offended, I urge you to stop watching this video now, but if you are still watching, brace yourselves. In at number 5 is the former Natty Death Camp Outfits. Outfits have warned people and said look this is not the place to be walking around catching Pokemon. Gotta catch them all does not apply to outfits so even if you see 18 Charizards in a gas chamber leave your phone in your pocket you idiot. The poisonous gas Pokemon coughing was sighted here at the Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC. Someone else found the Pokemon in front of these gravestones in memory of the victims and currently Outfits and the Memorial Museum are working together to put a complete stop to all Pokemon Go playing on these premises. In at number four, another place of memory that should definitely not be a playing ground, and that is the 9-11 Memorial. You have a higher chance of catching water Pokemon at water locations, but there's some things you just don't do. Here is a picture of a Magikarp washed up at the New York's 9-11 Memorial, and people have been using their phones to catch Pokemon here. I think this is the problem when locations like this become Pokestops, that people don't go there and all of a sudden consider the fact that in reality it's a 9-11 memorial and that they shouldn't be using their phones against it to you know benefit themselves on Pokemon Go because they need to respect other people around. I think soon enough we will see a wipeout completely of all these places which should not be Pokestops or anything related to Pokemon Go because there's seriously a lot of complaints going through about it. So you better get down there quickly before they change anything. Just kidding. At number three, they say don't drink and drive, but I say don't Pokemon go and drive. There has been a series of incidents of collisions, traffic holdups, uh, crashes, you name it. People have went off the road, all kinds of incidents relating to people just on Pokemon Go as they drive because as you rack up the miles, you level up, you gain XP and all that stuff. So people are having a tendency of just having it in their hands whilst they're driving, which is causing problems. So when you're at the wheel of the car, you may not think it will happen to you, but just don't bother. At number two, an absolutely shocking place that people are turning up to with the sole purpose of just catching Pokemon are these abortion memorials. Across America, there are around 600 of these memorials to uncompleted pregnancies and an alarming number of them are also places for people to score free stuff on Pokemon Go. 
Number one of the top five worst places to play Pokemon Go is a war zone. Crossing the road can be dangerous, being in a dangerous area can be too, but being on the front line of a war zone is possibly the worst place you can play Pokemon Go. Why? Because if you are distracted for a split second, it can result in immediate death. This links to the story of a soldier serving in Iraq who took this picture of him trying to catch a Squirtle on the front line, and he also in the post threatens ISIS to battle him. So that brings the countdown to an end guys, I hope you have enjoyed watching this video. If you would like to see more countdowns, let me know, put a comment, leave a like on the video. There will be much more videos coming soon to this channel, news topics, I also have a Pokemon Go series myself starting soon, so I hope you enjoy the future content I have in mind. Take it easy guys, and I'll see you next time. Okay, so yeah, just, you know, the Pokemon Go being kind of, I suppose, a, a perverse example of, of all of that, just the, the cutesy nature of the characters and everything next to the real world sort of serious sort of implications of where the game is being played and interacted with. I suppose that this will be, you know, I suppose, you know, one of the vital parts of that of the initial fad of it when it arrives next to what leads to significant social change. And I suppose the jury's out of it with Pokemon Go because it did really arrive as a fad, still is played, but broke into sort of, you know, a, a, a use of augmented reality or a different sort of play element to the real physical environment. Um, overall having positive experiences for most people to play but you can just see the significance when we look at the scale of it of these sort of you know these 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 um you, you know issues implications of the game that need to be kind of addressed now and the, the, the boundaries and notions of how real space is interacted with with a young group it's really interesting to talk about this type of stuff and um, just to see where that where their sort of thinking is or their morality might lie next to this and you know what role games should play or where the game should stop and the real world begins all very interesting topics of conversation to have with in group sessions and i would recommend that um just two more videos now one i just want to show where this is all going again in the virtual sense of the um potentially where it could go the, the overall thing, I suppose, being to see that the youth culture has kind of given way to this sort of broader, ubiquitous technological, techno culture, and the earliest adopters of that technology being sort of the, you know, the, 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 the closest sort of touchstone we have to what a youth culture might look like because, you know, people who are going to adopt and take the new thing in a faddish sense or for real change, that's the kind of bigger issue, I suppose. And then after that, just I want to show a video of William Gibson, who the you know would have invented cyberspace and the concept of that through the cyberpunk movement and the the and you know um, science fiction genre, I suppose, in the mid '80s, and just to kind of ha get a retrospective look from him uh, uh, at what has happened next to how it was initially imagined, I suppose. Uh, I'll do that. I'm going to cut off the Gibson one a bit earlier. The link will be on there for the full video, well, for the full interview, well worth a watch as well. And then I'll come back just to close the lecture out. When you think about what the most amazing place is, that people meet and work and play, I can imagine in 20 years that place not being on the surface of this earth. As early as I can remember, I was fascinated by this idea of simulation and of creating spaces. The thing that I naturally wanted to do was figure out some way to use the internet to connect tons and tons of machines together and have those machines create a world and then go into that world and see what people would do with it. That was really the idea behind Second Life. It was my first attempt at creating a world to do everything in 3D, move, communicate, build. With VR hardware, the idea behind Second Life of creating this open digital world is going to finally be fully realized. What High Fidelity is, uh, is a software platform that lets people experience shared VR. 
people together building, creating things in VR spaces. The first work that we've done at High Fidelity has really focused on two things. Being able to talk to somebody face to face, see your hands moving, see their hands moving, nod your head, speak to them, and also manipulating things. Because we think that, you know, using your hands to manipulate physical things is just a core part of the human experience. Just like the internet, there's this big question of what are we first going to do with VR? In the next year, kids are going to be able to put these things on and be completely inside a learning space with a teacher. Ending kind of business travel, I think, is another very possible near-term impact of VR. To have a two-hour meeting and fly to New York to do it, you know, and spend 10 hours of travel time for a two-hour meeting is pretty ridiculous. I suspect that we won't even remember the video games in a few years' time, not because they weren't cool, but because the overall impact on humanity of VR is going to be quite a bit larger. When you think about shared VR, you think about like building New York, right? And you've got this new New York that you can go to and have amazing meetings and entertainment and whatever. It wouldn't surprise me to see VR also be an escape where you are in New York and you put that headset on and you are suddenly standing by a river in a forest and there's nobody around and you actually use VR to remove yourself from the world for a while. If you look at the smartphone, it took about seven years for it to go from zero, the first iPhone, to two and a half billion people having these devices in their pockets all around the world. If you look at VR, we're at a similar point. I think we could see seven to 10 years being the same time frame where literally just about everybody on Earth ends up having one of these things. As bandwidth increases and as the speed of the computers increase, that means the size of that new virtual planet, you know, doubles. Uh, every two years. We're gonna have cities in the virtual world that are bigger than any living human city ever will be. The thing that's so cool about virtual worlds is that we are there and that, you know, to the greatest extent possible, the people that you encounter there are real people. It seems inevitable that once virtual worlds become literally larger in scale and also offer that one-on-one -on -one experience that is identical to this, to right now, it seems to me that almost certainly the majority of our creative time and our business time and our play time is going to move there. And joining us now is the well-known author William Gibson, author of Zero History, and a guy who um, has actually spent a lot more time in Canada than I knew. Uh, welcome, my fellow Canadian. Well, thank sort you of. very much. I mean, you're from the States originally, and I th thought most people figured you st still spent a good chunk of time in the States. But uh, No, I'm a Vancouverite since 71. Since 1971? Since 1971. Okay, terrific. Well, everybody, you're going to forgive me my starting here, but you probably get this all the time. Cyberspace. Everybody yeah. knows you're the guy who made up the expression cyberspace in 1982 in Burning Chrome. And when you first came up with that concept, what did you imagine it to look like? Well, when I first saw it, literally, it looked like the word cyberspace on a yellow legal pad in red Sharpie. And above it were written info space and data space. And both of those had been scratched out because they sounded stupid. But <laughs> cyberspace actually sounded as though it, it meant something. So it's going to be one of three. Yeah. Well, it was, those were the two previous choices. Yeah. So I thought, okay, cyberspace, that sounds cool. I have no idea at that point what it, what it means. So I'll have to fill it with meaning via the story that, that I'm going going to use it in. So you really, know, when I first saw it, it, it meant nothing. It was a hollow neologism. Do you, do you know where the inspiration came from that allowed you to put those two <clears throat> notions together? Yes. It, um, it came from watching kids play the very first generation of, of arcade video games, which were huge tank-like painted plywood constructions with a tiny screen at the, at the user end. And 
I didn't play the games myself, but when I'd walk past a video arcade, I'd see the posture and the, the incredible uh, tension of these kids as they, as they played, played the game. And seeing the physicality of their relationship to what was really just zeros and ones in a computer uh, really, really impressed me. And it also gave me the sense that what they were yearning for was to be on the other side of the glass of that, that cathode screen. They wanted to be in there with the colored whirling data that they were. So almost 30 years later, yeah. we have a <clears throat> cyberspace that is much more, I mean, the, the, the zeros and ones are a lot more filled out now than they were when you came up with the expression almost 30 years ago. What, what, what surprises you about what, the way it actually looks now compared to what you might have imagined almost 30 well, years ago? it's ubiquity. It's ubiquity and the absolute quotidian banality of much of what, what we do with it. And I actually, I think I suspected something like that when I was, when I was writing my imaginary cyberspace. I thought, well, people will use this for everything. They'll do incredibly boring things with it all the time. But I couldn't present it that way in, in the novel because it wouldn't have been exciting. So when I was making it an exciting action arena in Neuromancer, I suspected that if something like that ever happened, it, it would actually just be where we conduct the world. It, it would just be another part of the city, which don't, is really what it's become today. Well, that's what I was going to say. Don't, don't we, so just to make sure I understand, are you saying it has not fulfilled the potential that you imagined all no, those years ago? Because it no, seems not, like it's got everything now. Well, no, not at all. It's, I'm, I'm critiquing the capacity of a science fiction story to depict what a media platform will actually will actually do. If you look at the, I haven't tried this, but I imagine that if you went back and looked at all of the science fiction stories prior to television that depicted a world with television, television would be tremendously exciting in those stories, and it would be central to the resolution of some plot. And, but it wouldn't be television as we, we know it today, and it wouldn't come anywhere near the, the cultural weirdness of television that would produce reality TV in the 21st century. So. Let me quote you in an interview you gave with the BBC recently, where you said, cyberspace is colonizing what we used to think of as the real world. I think that our grandchildren will probably regard the distinction we make between what we call the real world and what they think of as simply the world as the quaintest and most incomprehensible thing about us. Uh, why do you think the distinction between the real and cyberspace has become so apparently eroded? Well, it, we're, not, we're not really, when we talk about that, we're not really talking about cyberspace as the internet and the World Wide Web as much as a, a sort of cloud of, of related technologies. And the sort of erosion I'm thinking of would be something like 30 years ago, if you watched individuals walk down Eglinton in Toronto on uh, a, a certain time of day, they, a lot of them would be alone. They would be actually alone. They would be out of touch. They would be unable to communicate unless they went to a phone booth. If you, if you watch the same scene today, most of them are talking to someone or texting as they move through, they move through the city. People today aren't alone. Uh, solitude solitude has, has become obsolete. They may be physically alone, but they're not actually 
well, alone. They're connected to something yeah, or someone all the time. I, I don't. I actually don't. I think that you know, it's the the distinction between it's the distinction between the physical and the the virtual that I'm questioning. Mm. If someone who grow someone who grows up constantly on the phone with with their friends as they're on on the move doesn't experience some very fundamental and basic element of, of solitude that all of us previously... Okay, kind of an interesting point to leave it on there. Well, we're finishing that. I just don't want to run over too far. Um, yeah, just the, the full immersion of humans and our societies in, in these sort of technologies and, um, you know, the, how, it's, how that's buffeting up against each other with the how we renegotiate the boundaries, real boundaries, civic space, civic life, um, our health, our well-being, how we relate and interconnect with each other, all these things kind of, you know, going much, much further than, a, you know, a simple sort of youth culture in a game environment, but certainly having spawned from there and have been imagined out of those environments as well. And mostly games and game environments being the most fit for purpose for this experience for these experiences to conduct themselves in so um yeah that's the end of this lecture um next lecture will be on gamification if you have any questions on anything that i've talked about here uh, i've kind of had to brush over a lot again i'm just trying to squeeze so much in because it's super interesting and there's so many diverse um you know examples and illustrations of where this is all going and as much as where it's come from that I'm trying to fit it all in. So apologies for running over again. But um, if you have any questions on anything, please hit me up with an email and uh, I'll see you in the next lecture if I don't speak to you before then. Okay, thanks. Bye.